Hello and welcome back. It's me, HJG White from Utoro, and welcome to another episode of Money Talks. So we're going to be talking about legendary super investor Michael Burry, the guy who correctly predicted the financial crisis of 2008. For those of you who live under a rock, Michael Burry is that guy played by Christian Bale in the film The Big Short, the film that has Margot Robbie in a bump. Okay. No, fuck off. We did a video on why we thought Michael Burry bought Warner Brothers Discovery. What we didn't go into was Michael Burry bought a bunch of other stocks at the time. And I was going to do a video breaking down each and every one of those stocks why I thought he bought them. But all of that's irrelevant now because Michael Burry has sold all of his positions in Q2 except for one tiny position in what I believe is an American correctional facility called Geo Group. Now, I could go into Michael Burry's position in Geo Group, but as Geo Group makes up less than 2% of what his portfolio was before he sold all of these positions, I don't think that's very interesting. It's not a very big position. What I think is much, much more interesting is why he sold all of these stocks. Why did he do this? There's one answer that feels really obvious to me, and that is that Michael Burry is simply tax loss harvesting. So what is tax loss harvesting and how does it work? What's the evidence that Michael Burry is tax loss harvesting? Why do I believe he's doing this? And how can this help us, you and me, become better investors? I was originally hoping that Margaret Robbie could explain this for you in a bathtub, but she didn't reply to my messages, so I'm just gonna have to do my best. Tax loss harvesting is when you close your positions at a loss. <laughs> Sorry, no, I can't do it like this. Okay, we're going back. We're going to do it the other way. Let's leave buff tub explanations to Margot. I think she does it a little bit better than me. So tax loss harvesting is when you intentionally close a position at a loss so that you can claim your losses against your profits. To make this really, really simple, here's an example. Let's imagine that you bought $1 million of Google and $1 million of Apple. And in this example, Google drops 500K and Apple rises 2 million. Now, overall, you've done quite well. You started off with 2 million and now you've got 2.5 million, but these are all unrealized gains. You can't spend this money yet. It's still locked in shares. So now you wanna take some profits from your Apple position. That's doing really, really well. Now, if I just close the Apple position, I'll get taxed on my $1 million of profits. However, if I close my Apple position and my Google position, I'll just get taxed on the 500,000 profit. The 1 million will be offset by the 500,000 pound loss. Now there is an issue here. In order to stop people doing this, the government implemented a rule that you can't then immediately buy back into the stock. You'll have to wait approximately 30 to 61 days in some circumstances before you can buy back into your position. So yeah, you'd have to wait 30 to 61 days before you bought back into your Google position and anything can happen to the price in that time. However, given the current economic situation, interest rates rising and inflation still very much on the rise, and presumably the interest rates are gonna continue rising throughout the year, and that means asset prices like stocks and shares will presumably keep going down, although we can't know this for sure, it's just very likely. Burry could easily have decided that closing these is easily worth the 30 to 60 day risk. Remember guys, when interest rates rise, it makes borrowing cash more expensive. When borrowing cash becomes more expensive, people end up with less money to buy assets, which in turn brings the cost of assets down. Hence why the central banks use interest rates to try and curb inflation. There is another way around this loophole. There is another loophole in tax loss harvesting that Charlie Munger used last year. Charlie Munger is the legendary super investor that partnered up with Warren Buffett to build Berkshire Hathaway, who also manages his own fund, The Daily Journal. Now, the Daily Journal notoriously bought 300,000 shares very bullish in the middle of the pandemic of Chinese company Alibaba as part of the Daily Journal. And then in a surprise move, when the price had dropped by around about half, Charlie Munger or the Daily Journal then bought another 300,000 shares, totaling around 600,000 shares. And so everyone was presumably thinking at this point that Charlie Munger was incredibly bullish on Alibaba. However, then in the very next quarter, as the price of the company had continued to slip, Charlie Munger had sold half his position, all the way back down to 300,000 shares. And so the reason I think that this was a tax loss harvesting move is because taxes on realized gains work chronologically. So Charlie Munger could buy into the stock and hold 
perhaps more than he'd like to for a short period of time, around 30 days, and then close his original position, his original 300,000 shares, and write that loss off against his gains on other positions, without having to go the 30 to 61 days that Michael Burry is potentially doing, not holding the stock. For Charlie Munger, this is very in line with his general investing philosophy. I think if Charlie Munger had really changed his opinion on the stock, he would have closed his entire position. However, what really shocked me at the time when Charlie Munger closed this position was just how few news sites mentioned the possibility of tax loss harvesting. Despite all the articles being almost entirely speculation, none of them speculated to this, which to me feels like the most obvious answer. And that's why I'm making this video and I think it's so important to talk about. So we know it can be worth closing positions at a loss for big investors because they can write that off against their realized earnings on other positions. What does it look like Michael Burry has done this specifically? This is where we get more into the nitty gritty. If we look at the stocks that Michael Burry was holding in Q1, if he was holding them at the end of Q1, this is what the prices of those shares would have been here. And because we don't get to know what exact price he sold for in Q2, it's assumed that he closed all positions right at the end of the quarter. This is what the price of all the shares would have been at the end of Q2. So you can assume the Q1 prices were, so you can assume the Q1 positions he had were around this price and the Q2 positions were around this price. What's remarkable is some of them would have closed at around a 25% loss potentially. So what I've done here is I've taken all the percentage changes of all the prices and I multiplied that by the weight they have in the portfolio. To give us a rough idea of how much of a loss Michael Burry might have made in that quarter. So here it is based on my estimations. Michael Burry should have made around a 9% loss in Q2. Now, 9% might not seem like a lot to all you guys. I know a lot of us probably have lost more than 9% in one quarter before. This is 14 million of the 160 million that he had invested. And it's quite a lot to lose on stocks like Alphabet. And these are quite safe investments. So this is quite a lot to close out on when purchasing these sort of stocks. A significant hit for a super investor of Michael Burry's reputation. Now, maybe he could have closed a few of these at highs and possibly even all of them. We really can't know for sure. We don't know exactly when he bought and sold on any of these positions. But knowing Michael Burry, I just think it's more likely that he bought into all these stocks when the market got hit by the original interest rate rises. And on the off chance that the market immediately recovered, he bought into all these positions. However, as they continue to drop after he purchased them, tax loss harvesting will have been more profitable than paying taxes on his realized gains. Now, finally, how can this help us with our investing? Well, for me, I find it extremely helpful to remember that there are things beyond the value of these businesses driving the individual super investor portfolios. For instance, if you bought Alibaba because you thought it had incredible intrinsic value, you might be pretty concerned seeing Charlie Munger, a legendary value investor who has analysts sitting inside China giving him information, selling half of his enormous position. But if you know a reason that this makes financial sense for him to do that doesn't affect the value of the company that you're purchasing, in this case Alibaba, well then you don't have to waste a lot of time looking for scapegoats like Chinese regulation for being the reason that he might have closed his position. For me, following super investors is a great way to find stocks to invest in and also learn from their investment styles and strategies and get to see it firsthand so that you can begin to build your own investing strategy. And I think it's really important that you have one that is right for you. But if you don't understand things like tax loss harvesting, people might be following things that only benefit the super investor and not their own portfolios. So that's all I want to talk about today. I have one day to try and hit my monthly target of 300 new subscribers. I'm just three away from hitting the target, hitting 300. So please, if you're not subscribed already, please do so. Also, if you want to see what stocks I'm holding, there's a link to my Toro page on my channel page where you can see all the stocks in my portfolio. And if you go to the stats page, you can see my entire, you can see my history of investing, the good years, the bad years, they're all there. Thanks so much for watching, goodbye. Now fuck off.